G'day GDL people and welcome to another edition of Scripting Adventure. This is Bruce from Barking Dog Bim. In this installment, we're going to look at a little bit more refined execution of the tube command. In the last installment, we looked at how to script tubes. And in that video, I showed you how you could create a tube along a circular path with a varying sweep angle. Now, if you tried this for yourself, you would have noticed that the tube snaps to the step angle. It won't go to the incremental in-between angles. Well, in this installment, I'm going to show you how to achieve that. I'll also run through those last few flags, display flags for the tube and explain what they mean. Here is the tube we created in the last episode in the 3D of said tube. I'll just open that and use file, libraries and objects, open object. I can use the shortcut key while it's selected, or I can use this button on my toolbar, open object. Restore down using this button up here. Now I'll open the 3D script window and a 3D view window. So what we've got here is I am starting from minus step angle. So remembering step angle was 15. That's what we set it at. So I'll start at negative 15. I'll run through to my sweep angle plus another step angle. So we'll run through to 90 degrees plus another step angle. And we'll put all those coordinates into my tube. In this case, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the lead in and the lead out. If you want to know what the lead in and the lead out are, check out the previous video, cover it there. That's a nice, tidy, succinct piece of code, but that only really works if your tube stops on a nice, neat multiple of the step angle, which is usually the case. Usually you want to stop it at a 90 or a 180 degree or a 45 degree angle, but there are cases where you actually want something a little bit different. And we can kind of see this. If I put in, say, 100 degrees, sweep angle, it didn't change at all. If I was to change this to 105, which is the next step, then it changes. But if I was to change this to 100, it'll drop back to 90. So that doesn't quite work in every instance. In order to work through this, I'll put in some 2D guides so we can see what's going on and some hotspots to help us work through this problem. What I've done is I've added just some lines at 15 degree increments so that we can get some visual indication of where the step angles are. I've added an outer diameter guide. I've put in some hot spots on each point as it goes around so we can see where they fall. And I've added some text to indicate the step angle at each point. I've also put in an angle dynamic hotspot so that we can freely adjust the sweep angle and get some live feedback, so understanding what's going on. I've added a couple of parameters for step angle and sweep angle. You'll notice that when they are parameters, I use an underscore to separate the words. And in the master script, I've swapped out my previous variables for these new parameters. And you'll notice that when a variable is just created in the script, it's use, uses camel case. This is part of the GDL style guide, and that's a nice quick way to determine where a variable is declared. So if you see an underscore, you should be looking in the parameter list. If it has no underscore, then it'll be in the script somewhere. So I've declared a unique ID so I can use it in my hotspot, put all my profile variables in the master script so I can use them in the 2D, the 3D, and the parameter script, and I've swapped out my step angle variable for the step angle parameter and the sweep angle variable for the sweep angle parameter. These are limited in their values, which you'll find in the parameter script. Values GS Resolve has a range of greater than or equal to six. That's what the open square brackets means, greater than or equal to, and less than or equal to 36. So that's what the Closed square brackets means less than or equal to. There we go. Greater than or equal to 6, smaller than or equal to 36, 
And I've done the same for step angle and sweep angle. 5 and 15 for my step angle range. And no smaller than a step angle for my sweep angle. And smaller than or equal to 360. There it is there. In my 3D script, I've taken the calculations out of the put command and given them some temporary variables because I'm using them twice now, one for the put statement and one for the hotspot statement. And then I add an extra bit, my text offset, which is declared up here, to put in my text. So it doesn't sit right on the point, it sits out a little bit. I've also added another logical statement called ends on and it determines whether the sweep angle is smaller than 360 or not and so when you do something like this the value that's returned will be either a zero or a one because it's a logical test if sweep angle is smaller than 360 it'll be true so ends on will be one if sweep angle is not smaller than 360 it'll be zero and i use that down in my tube statement down here the 16 and the 32, if you recall, will draw the beginning and the end lines. So if the sweep angle is smaller than 360, we want to draw the end lines. So ends on will be 1. 16 by 1 is 16. 32 by 1 is 32. So it will draw the end lines. If it's not smaller than 360, ends on will be 0. So 16 by 0 is 0. 32 by 0 is 0. So it won't draw the end lines. Once again, that's the power or the convenience of using binary flags. So we'll have a look at that quickly in 3D. So if my sweep angle is 360, it's not drawn the end line, so it looks like a complete toroid, complete donut shape. And if I back that off just a little bit, it's drawn the end lines. Now you notice that even though I put in 359 as my angle, it's actually drawn it to the last step increment. So let's fix that. I'll just return this back to 90 degrees. Excellent. One more thing, I'll show you the 2D script. So this is the angle hotspot. Now this is not a tutorial about angle hotspots. I'll do that some other time. I've changed my project two statement to a project two curly brackets three. Three to 72 is the same as your normal project two statement. And I've added these flags on the end, four, eight, and 16. And what that will do is that will project these hotspots out of the 3D window into my 2D window. So to show you what I mean there, if I turn those off, the four and the eight is to draw the lines and the surfaces. The 16 is the hotspot. So if I turn those off, no hotspots. So that's a nice little statement to know. There are two methods we can use to solve this problem. So if I bring this down to, let's say, that's nice, 145. We can keep our step angles as specified. And we just add in whatever last little bit is required at the end here. That's the first method. So we'll do that. So instead of taking this loop through to the sweep angle plus a step angle, we'll take it through to the sweep angle only. Then we'll put our final coordinate at the sweep angle. So that means our last point in the loop will be there. Then we need to put another point there. And then we need to put another point for our lead out at equal distance from there to there, but on the other side. So what does that look like? So that's our final point, that'll be there, but we need another one for our lead out. And we need to determine if this falls on a neat sweep angle or not. If it falls on a neat sweep angle, rather step angle, sorry, then we don't need to draw a fractional part. If it is part of a step angle, then we need to draw an additional point. What can we use to determine whether or not it's a nice, neat step angle or not? Well, I'm glad you asked. Under expressions and functions functions, we've got a command called fraction, FRA, and it will return the fractional part of whatever's in the brackets. If whatever is in here 
has a fractional or a decimal portion to it, that's what it will return. And the technical terms is if it has no fraction, it's an integer. If it has a fraction, it's a real number. So I'll introduce another variable called step fraction, and we'll make that equal to the fraction of my sweep angle divided by my step angle. So if I take my sweep angle, which is 145 degrees, divide it by my step angle, which is 15, I end up with a funky number. If that falls on, say, one of these two, so let's go 135 divided by 15, I end up with a nice, neat number, an integer. So that step fraction will be returning either zero or the decimal part of this equation. So then we can test for that. We go if step fraction, then I'll just complete the structure of my if statement. So I can test to see if step fraction is zero or not zero. If it's not zero, then it's a true statement. So if step fraction is greater than zero, then it will drop into here. Otherwise, it will drop into here. So if step fraction is greater than zero, that means it's sitting somewhere between the two points of my step angle. I want to put in my coordinates. And my x coordinate will be the cosine of my sweep angle. I'm just going to drop in here for a minute and show you what needs to be done. So the distance between there and there, because we're looking for the bisector, we want, I'll just mirror that line, we want our lead out to be from the sweep angle through to there, which is exactly the same length as from there to there. So we need to figure out the length of that line there and draw this point here, plot this point here to get our lead out. That's our sweep angle plus whatever that length is there. So it'll be our sweep angle plus our step angle multiplied by our step fraction multiplied by our leg length. Remembering that to find the x coordinate, it's cosine of the angle times the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse hasn't changed, we're just working out the angle. Then we do the same for the y, but instead of cosine, it's just sine of those step angles, zero, zero. And we'll put in a hot spot as well. Because I'm now using exactly the same formula twice, let's use some temporary variables for that. So this is what we do if it's falling part way. Otherwise, it'll be falling on a nice neat angle. So we just need to add sweep angle plus step angle. So we'll use the same strategy for that. Now here's a little trick. Because I've used exactly the same statement here and here, all my calculations are in these coordinates. I can actually take these out of my if statement and put them at the end. Tighten that code a little bit. So all I'm doing in here is the calculations, and then I'm putting the coordinates in and the hotspot in down here. Right, so that's my lead out. Just move this material down to just before my geometry statement, and I'll set the pen as well. Check my script, it's okay. Let's see what the result is. Keep an eye on this. Right, so it's actually drawing nicely. I'll draw in a guideline here so that we can see whether this is actually drawing perpendicular to the center. So if I draw a line from that sweep angle through to the center, there we go, it is exactly the angle that we want. So that seems to work, right? It seems pretty good. The problem, however, is because of how the tube generates its geometry, you can see that these points are falling nicely on our step angle, junctioning nicely where they're supposed to. But this last one is slightly off. Also, if I drag this sweep angle close to the last step angle. See that? You get this little segment here. Now it's drawing correctly, so that angle is correct right through there, but you can't get rid of that little sliver 
there if it's too close to the last junction. And that seems to be just a quirk of how the tube works. One of the ways to get around that is to draw the profile on the other side of the path. So let's have a look at that. So the profile, instead of being in the positive X, will make it in the negative X or negative U because it's the profile. So we've gotten rid of that little slither there, but we've still got a junction that's not quite right here, not quite what we want. I'll just change that back. So why would I use this method? This method's pretty good if one, your last junction's far enough away that it doesn't matter. But more importantly, if you want junctions to be meeting on your X and Y cardinal points, because then it gives you dimensional accuracy at these points. So if I'm looking at this in elevation, I'll want these 0, 90, 180 and 270 points to be exact where these meet, not somewhere over here, because then it foreshortens the true extent of your object in certain views. The other method we're going to look at now is instead of maintaining these step angles at what we've set, we will adjust those to be equidistant around our arc. And that's actually pretty easy to achieve once we've done all this hard work of setting this up. All this code stays the same. What we'll do is in here, instead of step angle being step angle, we'll say that step angle, and it's camel case step angle because that's what I'm using in my script, equals a sweep angle. And in this case, I could use either the parameter or the variable because they're both the same at this point in my script. But we want the sweep angle divided by integer. What is integer? That's under functions. Integer returns the integral part, always the integer. So if it's got any fraction part to the number, it'll just chop it off. We're just dealing with positive numbers in this script. Example 1.23 will just become 1. So we want the integer part of our sweep angle. Let's just make this the same. Sweep angle divided by our step angle plus the fractional part of sweep angle divided by our step angle greater than zero. Oops, in a bracket there. So what is this formula doing? If we've got a nice, neat tube that finishes on a step angle, let's make it to 90. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six divisions. 90 divided by 15, six. So we want to divide our sweep angle by six. That'll give us our step angle. If this falls just past it, so let's go 100 degrees, we've actually got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven divisions that we want to do. We don't want to exceed 15 degrees though, or we don't want to exceed the step angle as set by the user. So therefore we want to go, if there's a fractional part, then we want to divide it by whatever these divisions were before, plus one. So in our master script, we've got our logical statement here. If the fractional part of our sweep angle divided by our step angle is greater than zero, so if there is a fractional part, it will add one to that other calculation. So sweep angle divided by step angle equals six. If it's got a fractional part, then it will be sweep angle divided by seven, which will give us our step angle. That's what that formula is doing. So if it's a nice, neat sweep angle, it'll divide it neatly. If it's plus just a little bit, it'll add one to that division or number of step angles to give us our new step angle. So we'll save that. Let's have a look at what happens. So we've kept our sweep angle at 100, and you can see that the step angle is now 14.2857. 100 divided by 7, 14.2857. We take this round to what we had it at before, 140. There's our new step angle. It's not exceeding 15, because 15 is what the user has set here, 15 degrees. I can change that to 10, and it's not going to exceed 10. If I change this to 145, there you go, it's dropped down to 9.6 recurring. If I drop this back to 140, we see that that finish angle is exactly what we want. It's perpendicular to the center, and we've got our lead out forming the bisector properly. 
So those are the two methods. You can either put a little bit on the end and maintain your step angles, or you can change your step angle to be nice and neatly divided. I can change this step angle to say five degrees and I get a nice, a much smoother surface here. You wouldn't want to go much finer than five degrees because it's far too heavy on the poly count. There you go. Here's the command in the help, the GDL help. And what we're going to talk about are these mask controls. So in the last episode, we talked about J1, J2, J5, and J6. J1, as you may remember, the base surface is present, so the beginning surface here. J2, end surface is present. J5, base edges. The edges are visible. J6, end edges are visible. So we've got a handle on that. We know what that does. J7 and 8, cross-section edges are visible, surfaces articulated. Well, I understand the words, but hard to know what it actually means. Cross-section edges are sharp, and the surface smoothing will stop here in open GDL and rendering. Again, I understand the words. What does that mean? Well, let's have a look. We'll create a couple of parameters. We'll call it J7. These are not special parameters. Archicad doesn't recognize these in any special way. Just calling them J7 and J8 so that we can connect them with the help. Edges sharp. Actually, these will be booleans. Right. So I've got my end zone 16 and 32 by end zone. And what is J7? It's 64 multiplied by J7 plus 128 times J8. So that will turn on and off those two functions depending on whether or not I've got these turned on or not. Because remembering Boolean, zero is off, one is on. So let's have a look. If I turn on edges visible, I click in my 3D view. All right, that makes sense. So regardless of the fact that I'm within the automatic smoothing angle increment, 15 degrees or less, it's going to articulate those edges regardless. So I'll save that, have a look in the Archicad environment. So every edge is drawn. It's overriding the automatic smoothing. So we'll turn that off. All right, so that's what J7 does. J7, cross-section edges are visible. Surface is articulated. So imagine you would use that if you needed your increment to be low enough to engage the automatic smoothing, but you did want the edges to be seen. I've not encountered that scenario myself, but there it is. This next one, I'm not entirely sure it actually works anymore. So edges sharp. If I turn that on, nothing happens. If I have a circular profile, nothing happens. There seems to be no discernible difference between that being on and off. And if we have a look at the flag description, it says it's in OpenGL and rendering. Righto. Well, let's have a look at our rendering. Render a picture with it on, or is that off? With it off, render a picture with it off. Turn it on, let's render another picture. That's on. That's off. On, off. On, off. No discernible difference at all. Maybe if I go to basic renderer. That's one. That's two. So that's with the basic renderer. No difference. And if you have a look in the 3D, the 3D styles, if you go to the 3D style settings, it's now hardware acceleration. It used to say open GDL in here in previous versions. So my suspicion is that this no longer has any impact, but it may do in earlier versions. Now we've got J10, 11, 12, and 13. So that is base edges participate in line elimination. End edges participate in line elimination. Blah, blah, blah. Participate in line elimination. So these four flags or mask flags, participate in line elimination. 
What does that mean? So to demonstrate this, I'm just going to show you another tube. I'll be back in a few minutes. Five hours later. I've just quickly set up this tube object. This is one object. And what it does is it loops through twice and draws a tube in different locations. So it's the same length tube, same shape, and just adds some things to the transformation stack and draws the tube. And we can see here that the lines continue through. Now, because these, these two objects are touching, well, it's a one object, but because of these two geometry declarations are touching, you would want that to clean up, generally speaking, right? Same material, you would want those lines to be eliminated as it would in the natural Archicad environment. So this is where our J10, 11, 12, and 13 come into play. And these are 512, 1024, 2048, and 4096. And if you're wondering how these numbers are determined, it's got to do with how you count in binary, but eh, that's for another day. So let's add these in here. This is where we declare our masks. So we'll go 512, 1024, 2048, 4096. So we declare all of our line eliminations. So base, end, longitudinal, and cross sections. Everything. Let's see what happens. Nothing. Why not? That should work, right? Turns out you also need to add a statement to declare these two geometry statements as a single body. At the moment, they're two separate bodies, one object in the GDL sense, two separate bodies in the geometry sense. So that statement is body minus one. If I add that, that body statement will treat all previous geometry declarations as a single body. And there we have it. Those lines where they're touching have been eliminated. I'll bring this tube back to this corner. That line, line elimination still takes place. If I comment out that body declaration, they're back in. They're treated as separate bodies. However, this only works if they're touching. If they're overlapping, all bets are off. So if I take that back to the middle, so they're now overlapping, and even though my line elimination is active and I'm declaring my body, it's not working. That's how you use the line elimination flags. Make sure that your geometries are touching, not overlapping, and you've got the command body minus one after your geometry declarations. Well, that wraps this one up. Hopefully you actually will never need to use this sort of complexity in your script, but if you do have an object that needs to finish at a funny angle, this is how you achieve it. So I'll see you in the next one. Go script something.